put your bird sightings in the chat button. The chat button is also a great uh, area to ask Max some questions. So while he is doing the program, please, any questions you have, go ahead and type them in and send them along. After the program, Max will view all the comments, questions, and sightings, and just kind of uh, go over everything with everybody. So um, welcome, Max, to our um, February <clears throat> part program. Max's been a great contributor to a lot of our programs. He's one of those world traveler birders, so we zero in on a lot of his bird um, trips and um, travel logs, but because of COVID, he hasn't traveled much. So he's gonna go very local this time. We're gonna actually have our winter birds that we see in our backyard and the visitors that are in our backyard. And I, I know I do, but in the winter is when I have the most birds ever. I just have sparrows and finches and juncos and fox, I mean, um, hermit thrushes. So you know, winter is an exciting time. So we're gonna welcome Max to our February program, Winter Birds, Neighbors and Visitors, Birds of Our Backyard. Welcome Max, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it very much. Um, this talk is kind of a revised talk that I give to the uh, Snow Goose Festival workshop I teach. And uh, what I've done is kind of made it hopefully a little more interesting for some of you that are veteran birders and uh, also people are our casual birders. So if I can do both of those, I'll be very thankful. Um, I do wanna let you know that uh, I have a lifetime teaching credential, which as some of you have attended my talks before know that I can give pop quizzes. And that's the bad news. Uh, the good news, however, is that uh, you get to correct your own papers when you Zoom, so you don't have to worry about it. So here we go. Uh, just showing this uh, introduction, uh, introductory slide here of uh, two of our, our icon birds out in the valley, which are leaving, and they're leaving soon this year. As we had our talk last year from uh, Laura, uh, mentioned that the snow goose were leaving kind of early. So this is to say goodbye to these birds as they head north. Uh, I heard some of my sandhill cranes the other day for the first time, so they're they're moving also. But let me get into my talk here, and whoop, I gotta do something here. Why doesn't that work? Ah, there we go. Um, I like to always start my talk when I, I do it at the uh, Snow Goose Festival by saying, most of you probably have uh, grandkids or children of your own, and you might buy them a coloring book and you give them, I guess one day it used to be crayon, but nowadays it's, uh, it's uh, colored pencils and whatever else they use. But you have them, they would color in the bird as you see here, and then they would bring it to you and they would say to you, is this a real bird? Well, let me tell you, you would say uh, if they brought you this bird over here on the left, you might say, well, that's a very pretty bird, honey, but uh, it probably doesn't really exist. It's just too many colors. Well, as you probably know, most of you, that this really is a true bird. It's a paradise tanager found down in Peru and Colombia and Ecuador. And look at the colors in that bird. I mean, if a young child colored in that coloring book with these, would you probably say no, that that bird couldn't exist? Uh, and we have our own here in the States too, the painted bunting. Uh, we don't see it in California. It's quite rare here in California, but uh, uh, it still has a remarkable different, like, like mother nature's had paint left over on the palette and decided to add it to all that sort of thing. Um, some of you may or be new to birding and, and one of the things you do is come to some people that know what they're doing like Jennifer and Mary and others and say, uh, I had this bird in my backyard and we ask you, uh, and what did it look like? It was brown. Then there's a long pause and you go, ooh, um, can you be more specific? Well, one of the things you can do to help somebody identify a bird is to give a shape of the bill. Now that's not always that easy unless you get good looks, but if you can, it helps things. Here's the general's uh, bill here that you would probably expect to see on a uh, scrub jay, for example. Um, Insect catching would be like a fly catcher. This is a two dimensional picture here. So that bill looks more conical, but it would be wider if you could see it in 3D here. And of course a seed eating bird would have that bill. Cross bill, very specialized for getting seeds out of a pine cone. Uh, by the way, there are left build and left build and right build uh, 
um, birds <laughs> that, that have that kind of uh, configuration. And of course, chiseling would be a woodpecker and that sort of thing. So if you can help out uh, to uh, somebody, if you have a bird you're not sure of, you want somebody to explain, uh, tell you what it is, give a little more information than say it's a brown bird and it's the size of robin, because that normally doesn't help things too much. Now, what to plant? Uh, when I give that talk, like I say at the uh, at the Snow Goose Festival, people always ask me what kind of plants attract birds. Well, there's a wonderful site on your National Audubon Society website. I'm not going to spend any time writing this down for you, but if you just go on National Audubon Society website, you'll find one plants for birds, as you see here, and it'll break it down literally to sections of California and all across the United States. So it tells you what plants you can plant in your area to attract the birds that you're most likely to get, rather than giving you a generalized one. So I'm not going to leave this up for you to copy it down because you can simply um, you can simply do it online by just going on National Audubon Society website. Now, what do birds eat? Well, this is another thing I talk about. And obviously you have our seed eaters and the black oil, sunflower seeds and so forth and so on. Niger seeds, oh my goodness, Niger seeds. Um, mistletoe berries even, pyracantha, which can be messy as you know, and uh, Christmas berry. So these are pretty much seed eating birds. A lot of people say I have this kind of beautiful yellow, I think it's a warbler, but it won't come to my seed feeder. Well, it's because it's not interested in seeds. We have the insect insectivorous feeders here. And these are some of the things that they eat. And it's pretty obvious what they eat, the beetles, the aphids. Uh, if you have rose plants, you're probably happy to see these birds in your backyard, eat the spider. You can put up suet, suet uh, feeders, which have uh, basically fat-based stuff in there for those birds, um, creepy crawlies. And you can also get mealworms. And mealworms are really the larva of the tenebrio molitor beetle. And you can get them online. There was a sale last week on them. You could get the 500 for 895 and they're usually 999. Now, one of the things is if you put out these beetle larvae or meal, we'll call them mealworms from now on. Um, one of the good things is if you have leftovers because the birds did not come, you didn't get the right birds to eat your uh, mealworm. Well, what you can do then is you can put them in your salad or you could even have a mealworm hamburger. These are not made up things, they're actually true. These are mealworms. The Chinese quite often, not shouldn't say often, but do have salads where you can have a mealworm salad. So you can use your leftover mealworms and have a place to put them and have a nice salad. Uh, tasty, I'm sure. And by the way, very nutritious, by the way. One of my all time favorite birds, and it seems funny to say this, is the turkey vulture. I wish I could fly like a turkey vulture. Wouldn't that be great? Put out those wings and lock them in place and just look for a thermal and just have a wonderful time for yourself. Um, they are residents here, but they do migrate. So uh, there is a festival down in Kern County. I believe it's either October or September, probably September, October, where they meet for a month and they count the number of turkey vultures that fly over. They count about 35, uh, the average is 25,000 turkey vultures migrate over the Kern County area where they do their count. They've had as high as 27,000 at one time. So that's remarkable. But there is a residential uh, group we have here. One of the things that probably makes you wonder what they're doing is the turkey vulture is that when they see a roadkill, they fly down, feed on the dead squirrel, whatever. Car comes along, they all fly up to the fence. Car goes by, they fly back down again, start feeding another car, they fly back up. And you think you used to say, why don't you pick the, the squirrel up and carry it off? Well, they don't have the grasping talons that hawks have. So pretty much they have to feed on where the dead roadkill is. If it's on the road, then they're gonna be going back and forth to the road. One story I got a big kick out of was uh, Dr. Luis Baptiste from uh, the Academy of Sciences who has passed away many years ago. But uh, he was on a talk show in San Francisco and a lady phoned in and said, uh, I have this big black bird with a red head in my yard and I don't know what it is. And he said, well, have your husband go out and go stand on the other side of him. And if you can see him through the nostrils, it's a turkey vulture. And there was a pause and the lady said, is that the best field mark? 
And he says, no, no, but it's one of the few birds that doesn't have a septum. So you can actually see, see through the nostril, as you can see in this photograph here on the right hand side. And it's not a buzzard. They're not related to the, the uh, vultures of Africa. Um, it's still a little bit debatable as to what they family they belong or um, order they belong into. Uh, some still have them in originally the, in the Falcoformes. Others say they're more closely related to uh, uh, storks. And I think the argument is still going on on, uh, on the turkey vulture. Um, they're really a great, great bird. And I think, you know, we look at the head and think, hey, what an ugly bird. And actually it's one of the more spectacular birds around. Uh, they do defecate on their feet. Some say to cool themselves off. Some say to kill any bacteria they might have picked up on the carcass. And by the way, they prefer fresh food. However, uh, they can't because the bills and their feet are not strong enough, they can't break in the carcass until usually they either rot and break open or another carnivore comes in and kind of um, breaks open the, the carcass for them. Uh, so, but given a choice, uh, they prefer fresh food. And by the way, they can actually hunt by sight and smell, unlike the African uh, vultures, which uh, don't do that. So anyway, one of my favorite birds and we should give them more credit than we do. Now, when I do that talk also, I always talk about birds that they can see when they walk out that day from the Snow Goose Festival, rather than showing them pictures of uh, birds out of a, uh, a book and say, you can see these birds right outside today. And so here's our two that we have coming to our feeders now. And if you have a feeder and uh, you use niger seed or thistle seed, you know they can eat you out of house and home. Remember I told you about bill before, and you can see here, this bill is conical and this bill is conical. So these are probably more likely to be uh, seed eaters, of course, which they are. Um, sometimes you can confuse them. They're not all easy to tell apart. Sometimes the lesser is very yellow all the way underneath and everything else, but it's not always there. Uh, and sometimes it can look very much like, like the American goldfinch if you don't get a good look at it. Two things I recommend uh, for identifying them one, it's kind of chancy, and that is this tick mark you see here on the uh, primaries. Uh, on a lesser goldfinch, it tends to be much more extensive. It's not showing that much in this picture, but it, it is much more extensive. And also, the undertail coverts are yellow in the lesser goldfinch, while in the American goldfinch, they're white, and that's in all plumages. So that might help you if you sometimes get confused between these two. Um, they're coming to you. If you have a feeder now and you would put out niger seed, you know, as I say here, you almost need to get a second mortgage to be able to keep, a, keep them in their niger seed. So two neat birds that are seen right now. Now, in a few months, of course, we're going to be seeing this. Uh, I'm not going to be playing songs because we seem to have messed up our audio when I do that. So I'm going to let it go. In my talk, I play some of these songs. But now in a couple of months, those two birds are going to look like this. Um, the most of your American goldfinch, they stay late almost into June uh, before they move to, to nest. Most of them leave California, but there are some breeding population, uh, population that do stick around. Uh, the lesser goldfinch do stick around. And uh, I'm going to talk about uh, this alternate and breeding plumage a little bit later on because names have changed over the years and we'll talk about it. Here is the tick mark I was referring to earlier. Notice how extensive it is here. But the yellow under here is also very good, while under the American goldfinch here, you see it's white. And the tick mark is there, but not nearly as extensive. So uh, in this plumage, you're not going to mistake them for either one, obviously. They're pretty, pretty straightforward here. Um, now, when I do my talk, I go to a pop quiz. As I told you before, being a licensed for life teacher, I can give you a quiz. So take out your blue book and answer the following questions. And don't forget, you get to answer your own questions and grade them. What are these two? Well, most of you people are pretty well aware what these two are, but just like if you're fairly new to the thing, um, when I talk to those people, I point out that every time you get confident, sometimes your confidence gets kind of shaken. Here you can see under here, it's got a little bit of white under here. So this is probably a lesser goldfinch huh, with the tick mark. And this of course is a pine siskin. And you say, well, there's a tick mark here, but you see the yellow and you see the forked tail and you say, there's something wrong with that, not to mention the streaking underneath. So when I do my talk, I, I do it this way, just to show people that um, you take things for granted, you can be mistaken in birding and that's half the fun of, 
of burning is having these these questionable things and say, what is that one? Why is I don't think I've seen that one before and so forth. Uh, we were talking before we began the uh, program tonight about the uh, the affection, the salmonella that the uh, pine siskins are undergoing right now. And it seemed to be, uh, I think Mary and, and Jennifer both said they seen birds that had kind of puffed up look at them. So it's too bad. Now, obviously all of us are familiar with our good old, old California quail, our state bird. Um, I had at least 10 of my feeder today, taking all the leftovers uh, from my feeder. Um, they are being were used quite a bit in movies back in the 50s for movies taken in Australia and in, in uh, Africa. In Australia, they would play some background. They would play some quail to represent birds. And they would play California quail in African movies, if you can imagine. And uh, the people in Australia are not all happy with this. They've been introduced several places in Australia. One is outside of Perth in the hills outside of Perth, that's Southeast Australia. And they're considered a pest there because they're getting into the uh, um, uh, crops and things there. So they're not all that pleased with our, our good California state bird in, in Australia. Um, usually when they come around your backyard, you'll see one bird standing on the fence or sitting on the fence while the other ones are all down feeding. There's one usually on guard uh, before they all feel safe about uh, coming down and joining the flock. They kind of check things out, looking for cats more than likely. Anyway, our California state bird. Then of course we have a mockingbird. Mockingbirds are kind of interesting. Um, they're omnivorous. The bill kind of indicates it's more of an omnivorous type bird. Um, the do mimic other birds uh, calls. Uh, Don Kuzma, a uh, uh, person who studied bird songs has claims that have about a, they can imitate about 150 different birds in their calls. Kind of interesting. Also, there weren't all that common in Northern California or all the way up to Washington in the 1930s. Um, they've expanded their range and uh, housing projects because they love us. They love people. They love the food that we bring with us, our backyards. And they've kind of moved all the way up through California, all the way up to Oregon and into lower British Columbia now. Uh, the mockingbird says, hey, you people build them, I will come. And sure enough, they have. Um, all of you know the calls and songs and on and on and on that the mockingbird does. But sometimes you hear them, hear them in the middle of the night. And to make it you, besides getting mad and waking you up, you should feel a little sorry because we tend to think and we believe that that is an unmated male that is singing late at night because he's not made it up. So it's a little, little sadness to the male uh, mockingbird that's trying to sing at night and, and hasn't got a mate, kind of sad. Now, since we're talking about state birds, I'm gonna give you another test. You have about five or 10 seconds to answer this question now. What bird is the most common state bird in the United States? Here's your choices. American goldfinch, Western meadowlark, Northern mockingbird, Northern Cardinal, Blue Jay, two of the above are tied and one of the above is mythical. So you got your paper, write down your pick. Let's see how you did. Here's your answer. In the States of the United States, seven have the Northern Cardinal as being their number one um, state bird. Western Marlock, Meadowlark surprisingly is six. Northern, Northern Mockingbird is five and the Blue Jay is zero. You would have thought the blue jay, which is so prevalent back east, uh, would be a state bird somewhere, and it's not. Now, if you didn't get a, this test right, I have you give you a chance to a uh, bonus question here. There are three state, three excuse me, three states. You drink of water here, excuse me. There are three states have non-native state birds. Name the state and their state bird. All right, give you a few seconds here. And our non-patriotic states are Rhode Island, who has the Rhode Island red as their state bird. Delaware has the Delaware blue hen as their state bird. And South Dakota has the ring-neck pheasant, which you all know it's from Asia and the Himalayas and all that good stuff. Now, obviously the first two are uh, a domesticated, basically red jungle fowl that's been domesticated over 
time into what we call a chicken, basically. And so Rhode Island and Delaware have chickens, so, so to speak, for their state birds. And uh, for the mean, uh, meaningless fact here, the University of Delaware football team mascot is the blue hen. And if you ever see a football game, that Delaware is playing, which are not very often on TV, but if they are, you will see a man dressed up or a woman dressed up in a blue hen outfit dancing around on the field. So there you are, non-patriotic states, Rhode Island, Delaware, and South Dakota. Now, Western Meadowlark. Uh, the Western Meadowlark, of course, is a bird that's common in a resin here in, in, uh, in Chico area. Um, notice the bill. You might think it's a woodpecker type bill, but it's certainly not a seed eater. It's a probing bill, as you can see here in, in the Western metal arc here. And that's exactly what they do do is probe into the ground to feed. Um, now they'll pick up spiders other things too, but they are a probing bill, has a probing bill. Um, and you say, well, I saw them for a while and then they're gone. Well, they're not gone very far. They're an open country bird for the most part but they prefer soil that's kind of at least moist enough so they can probe easier. So if your lawn dries out or your backyard dries out and suddenly your meadow, meadow larks aren't there, it's because they want to go to find a better place to, to feed. So we do have our meadow lark, beautiful song, as you know. Now there is an Eastern meadow lark, as you see over here on the upper right. Uh, and by the way, you can see the nice white outside tail feathers on the, on the bird here in this particular case here. Uh, and, you, and when they fly, they fly with kind of a delta and they flap, flap, flap and kind of glide to the ground, as you know. Now, I show you the one in the middle because uh, it's very difficult to tell a Western metal arc from an Eastern metal arc. Two of the things they always talk about is that the uh, Eastern metal arc has a much wider supercilium right here, eyebrow, very bright compared to the more dull of the Western metal arc. Another thing they say is the yellow in the throat area moves up here to the malar area and kind of blocks out the malar area, while in the eastern metal arc, it's kind of white. Now, I've been in areas where supposedly eastern and metal and western overlap, and I don't know, I have a hard time with that. What would you say this one is? For example, it seems like the yellow has kind of gone into the, the malar here a little bit and hit a little bit of the white, and but the eyebrow is very bright white, which is supposed to be a characteristic of the Eastern and the throat is supposed to be characteristic of the Western. And so what is it? Well, according to the Cornell, uh, Cornell Lab uh, website, that one is a Western metal arc. So I think they're really hard to tell apart uh, unless you hear them sing. The songs between the two are different and that's going to be your big hint. Uh, I have never seen one out here of the Western metal or Eastern metal arc, anything that resembled it, or I have heard one do it, and they're just not found out here. So you're pretty well safe and, and not, likely to, uh, not likely to see one anyway. So nothing to worry about. But if you go to an area where they overlap, it's tough. Uh, house finch, common bird. Quite often a person will tell me that I have this brown bird in my backyard. And it's got some streaking under it. And I anything else? And they say no. Well, it's usually <laughs> it's a typical bird because it's our our female uh, house finch, and uh, it is a difficult bird to describe because there's not much to it. The male gives you a lot of hints on what it is. Again, a nice conical bill, so you know it's a uh, um, a seed eating bird. Um, now, this is a bird that's actually gone east. Um, We've heard about other birds that were introduced in the United States and come out our way, which we'll talk about a little bit later on. In nine, uh, somebody released house finches in, in, in New York area, in New York City. Um, they claimed they were released from a pet store. At least that's the story. But since that time, they've come all the way across both east and west across the United States. Um, they have the widest ecological range of any living bird because they go to all habitats, all the way across this United States. Um, and they have a beautiful song. I'm not playing songs. Uh, I have a little thing here. I don't want to touch it because it closed, it shut down our audio. So I don't dare do it again. But they have a beautiful song and we don't give them any credit for it because they're so common. We just kind of, oh, it's just a, just a, just a house finch. 
you know, and all that. And we should give them more respect than we do. Yeah, they are really a kind of a neat bird. Um, the, red, the red that you see on the male is due to what it eats. Uh, I know when I was in Maui years ago, a lot of the uh, house finches, they were introduced there, a lot of house finches there are actually yellowish. Where you see the red, you'll see a yellowish because they don't have the same food to give them the reddish color they have here in the States. And I'm not sure exactly what they feed on that gives you that, that red color. Somebody else might know and they might be able to help you out. Good, neat bird and, and we don't give them enough respect. Oh, another pop question. This is a question I used to give at the Snow Goose Festival. So you wise people are veteran birders or think it's kind of silly. But the question I say to the group is, uh, how many of you have seen a blue jay in the valley or the foothills? And invariably in that introductory workshop I do, I get hands that go up. And then I, uh, being very smug, of course, I say, oh, then you've seen this. I remember one lady said she had five in her backyard one time. And when I put this slide up, they go, oh, no, I don't, didn't see that. And that, of course, is the blue jay that is very, very rare here in California. I used to say after I did this routine with them, uh, I would say, you're not going to see this bird in California. Well, a lot of you know that I got hoisted on my own petard because in 19, I mean, in 2012, there was one on Stanley and Avenue right off of uh, the Dayton Road that was there for quite a while. A blue jay showed up there. There's only been, I think, 11 records for California. They sometimes make it up into the Northwest a little bit, uh, Montana area and places like that, but it's very rare here in California. And like I say, the, uh, in, in 2007, uh, when the Rare Bird Committee put out a book uh, uh, in 2007, there was only 11 records. So we know at least there's 12 since we've had this one in uh, 2012. So the secret about birding is never say never, because when you do, you end up getting embarrassed. What of course the people were seeing in, in that class were the California scrub jay. Now, maybe some of you know or don't know that now the scrub jay has been broken down into four groups or four, I should say, four species. Um, the, um, I go by the eBird Clements uh, uh, system for uh, uh, naming uh, species. And they agree that there are now four. There is the one we have and we're familiar with in our own backyard around here, our resident California scrub jay. And, uh, but there is another one that is found east of the Rockies. And I actually put the, the, uh, the map here where it's found. This is the Woodhouse scrub jay uh, that the, uh, the eBird and several other ornithological groups have decided is a separate species than our California scrub jay. And you can see where it's found. So you see even in Nevada, uh, in here and down in the Texas, there's the now considered the Woodhouse scrub jay. So if you saw a bird there on one of your trips and you just have it down as scrub jay, uh, I mean, California scrub jay or Western scrub jay, as it was originally called, Western scrub jay, you can now say that you have a Woodhouse scrub jay if you don't mind the fact that you did not identify it as such. They are darker underneath, as you can see here, and the back is much, much bluer than our species here. But there's two subspecies of the Woodhouse scrub jay. And uh, the one in Texas looks very much like ours. I've seen that one and boy, I don't know. But in any case, so the other ones would be the Florida scrub jay. So we have the California scrub jay, the Woodhouse scrub jay, we have the Florida scrub, scrub jay, and uh, we have the uh, island scrub jay, or would also known as the Santa Cruz scrub jay, which is only on the Santa Cruz Island. So you'd have to go there to get that bird on your list. Other jays, of course, are the Stellar's jays. Now, the Stellar's jays that we have out here are what we call the West Coast type. And one of the ways you can tell them is, and we'll call these eyebrows, we know they're not eyebrows, but these feather tufts here are blue in our birds out here. Well, they are white in the Rockies and a little white usually shows up here. Sometimes you can see that hint here, but not very often, the white here and the white here. Now I spend a lot of time in the Sierras and when it's a very slow day and all I see is, is, is stellar jays, I look to see if I ever could find one that has the white. And I've never seen one and I've been birding for 50 years or some god awful time, I can't remember exactly. But uh, there is a, that is the Rockies bird and I haven't seen them. Now we do get these, these are really in a way migratory here. Now, if you live in the foothills and you're up in paradise and places like that, 
then some of my talk doesn't make a lot of sense. You say, well, no, that's a common, that's a resident bird. But down here in Chico, we get them in the wintertime. If the crop seed crop changes or whatever food crop is not them doing them well, they'll move down here into the Chico area uh, out toward the Sacramento River and places like that. You'll find Stellar's Jays down here. But uh, normally they like the conifers more than they like our open area down here. Um, so there you go. We have four scrub jays now. Again, California scrub jay, Woodhouse scrub jay. We have the Florida scrub jay and the Santa Cruz Island scrub jay. Uh, I think they've changed that name to, uh, let me check here for you. So I don't give you bad information here. Um, I think that line, here it is. Um, I think it's just called the Islands, the Island Scrub Jay now. The Island, Santa Cruz Island Scrub Jay is now just the Island Scrub Jay. There you go, four of them. But a good point of my story is never say never about birds. Now, feather color, I think, is interesting uh, to people. And in my talk, I, I talk a little bit about because people have a lot of questions about it. Deaths are pigments in feathers. And basically, there are two major groups of bird pigments. The melanins, as you see here in my outline here, are microscopic particles, and they produce black. But they also blackish. I shouldn't say black. Kind of dark, 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 dark brown is blackish. They'll take a yellow color and make it dull yellow, and red and make it dull red, and brown. These are your melanins. You also have the lipocrums, which are really diffuse fat droplets. And they'll bring out the bright yellows and the reds and the orange if there aren't any melanins included in them. Now, interesting, there is a true black. It's produced when all wavelengths of light are absorbed. Well, that presents an interesting thing. So if, if we had a bird that was, quote, true black, and let's give it a, a yellow bill and pink legs, and it flew by you, it would be like looking into a black hole you see the pink, pink bill and you see the, I mean, sorry, the yellow bill and the pink legs, but there'd just be this black void flying by you because there's no color there. There's nothing to bounce off it. In the laboratory I just saw recently, God knows why, it's happened to be wandering around on the internet, that they've got it down there in a the lab where 0.035% of light is actually reflected off a, a piece of tin foil that they put a special blackish material on. I don't even quite understand what it was, but it's on a foil of aluminum. It's all crinkled. You can see the outside of the, you know, the foil, which is reflecting normal aluminum light, um, light off of it. And in the middle, it's completely black. You can't even see the wrinkles of the, of the uh, aluminum foil because nothing's bouncing off it to your eyes. And it looks like a hole, deepest black you can imagine. So pigments cause color, get back to my talk here. And then we have the structural ones. Uh, these produced by light waves bouncing off uh, the wing and basically structure. I'm gonna, oh, I guess I can't do that. I can't remember. I was gonna show you a feather, but I don't think I can do that. So unless I say, maybe I can put myself back up here. Oh, that's Jennifer. Am I here? Here I am. Um, if I take this, light and get it in the right angle here. You can see the blue, I hope, uh, of the, uh, this is a uh, stellar jade feather actually, and you can see the blue. But I wanna caution you, there is no color there. This is the color of that feather. What you're seeing is blue being reflected off the structure of the feather itself. There is no blue color there, no blue pigment. So. That is kind of interesting in that, that that's what you're seeing. So now if you see, let me get myself off here so I don't scare too much the kids and the cats and stuff like that. Um, if you go to white, that is of course all the wavelengths bouncing off the structure of the feathers. And that can be intense if the feathers actually have air bubbles in them. That'll make it even brighter white coming off because all the wavelengths are being reflected. Um, and feather structure you see is basically the, the ridges and, groove, ridges and grooves in the feather itself. Uh, and some things are canceled, some things are not canceled and so forth and so on. And whatever bounces off, it comes to your eye. Now, if you change your, your viewpoint on a J, whether it be stellar J or blue J or, or a scrub J or a stellar J, the color doesn't change. It still remains blue. 
all right? Because it's not an iridescent color, it's a structural color, all right? However, iridescent colors are filled by things called melosomes, and there may be seven to 15 layers of these that give you the color of the gorget of a, of a hummingbird. And that depends on which way you're facing. If you face toward the sunlight, so it's reflected off, you see that beautiful gorget color, and then it turns its head a little bit to the right or something, and suddenly it turns black on you. And that's because it cannot, it's not reflecting that iridescent color off those layers and layers and layers of melosomes that build up the gorget of the hummingbird. Now, you can see how you can also have a combination of those pigments. For example, a green parakeet, a parakeet is due to the yellow pigment and structural blue. So part of the feather is structural blue throwing out the blue and the pigment yellow pigments in there and you get a green parakeet. A blue parakeet is actually due to a mutant. Uh, the green gene uh, has a uh, uh, um, single green gene that blocks the yellow pigment. So now you got a combination of the green uh, 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 the structure of the blue coming through while the yellow pigment is gone. And so you can't get the, you don't get the uh, green color. The green color goes away. And all you get is the blue parakeet because you're getting just the, re the refracted light, the structural blue and not the green. It's kind of, kind of interesting. Got all that? Oh, by the way, you know, they, they have a little gland. Birds have a gland uh, right at the rump area where they, they spread uh, um, uh, a solution onto their, their, their feathers. And at one time was thought to, to waterproof them. Uh, a man who wrote the book called Feathers, uh, Thor Hansen, he took some feathers uh, from, uh, I think it was a, a jay, I'm not sure, but a bird like that. He put them in a, a, a pan, filled it with water, added soap and washed the feathers like for about half hour. He kept doing it and doing it, trying to get the oil off the feather. Having done that, he put them aside, he let them dry, went back, poured some water on them, water rolled right off. So this gland, gland in the back uh, on the rump of birds they use to clean their feathers with really doesn't make them waterproof at all. The feather structure itself is waterproof in itself. It doesn't need any oil from that, that gland. It's probably more to keep bacteria down and, and, and keep the feather structure going uh, healthy to the feather. Oops, sorry, wrong thing. Now, two birds that we have down here, one is a resident, the black Phoebe, and then we have, of course, the Sage Phoebe who comes down and spends the winter. One comes down in front of my house and sits on a barbed wire right across from me. Uh, and they're both fly catchers. The Phoebe comes from the, people claim the sound it makes. I don't hear very well. And it's a bird that I have a hard time hearing now in my old age, the Phoebe sound. And to me, it never really sounded like Phoebe anyway, but some people claim they do hear it that way. Uh, this guy's a resident all year long. Uh, he likes to be near water. He'll add mud to his uh, nest. Uh, the female male will build the nest and he'll add the mud to it to build the nest. And um, it is a flycatcher, basically. Oh, the bill again, looks more conical or doesn't look almost straight because you're seeing it on the side. It's a little wider than you would expect. The sage Phoebe leaves us. It doesn't nest down here. It'll head up north again, almost just across the Oregon border, maybe up in the northeast corner of California. They may nest up there, but around our area here in the uh, main part of the Sacramento Valley, northern Sacramento Valley, the sage Phoebe uh, doesn't nest here. Uh, they, you say, why would a flycatcher hang around here in the cold, although we've had a pretty warm winter, uh, when you know most of your insects aren't doing well, and why would they even make a try to make a living here? They, if you notice, stay low to the ground. The the Phoebes feed from the their perch usually down to the ground and back up again. Now, not to say they won't take an insect out of the air if they can, but basically they fly down to the ground and up again down there because the ground is warmer. The ground is warmer than the air temperature normally, and so therefore, if they're going to get insects, that's where they're going to be. So it's kind of a allows them to hang around here in the cold weather, even though they were a fly catcher and you would think they would find better, better places to live than that. I was on a trip to, uh, uh, actually was uh, Peru and this bird popped up on a fence line, not my picture, I stole this uh, photo from uh, Ivan tweets there. This was taken in Colombia and I saw this bird and I was stunned by, stunned by it. I said, I don't know, my, my guy came over, what's the matter? I go, I got a bird. And, uh, it looks kind of familiar, but I'm not sure what it is. And he says, oh, that's a black Phoebe. 
And I said, really? Because look at our black Phoebe's up here. You see where the, the black stops and it's all white under here and the, the wings are really kind of dull. And yet the black Phoebe down in uh, South America has a lot more interesting markings on it with the big broad wing bars and you know edging to the primaries and then and, and black all the way down almost to the vent area. So shows goes to show you every time you think you know there is all the know all you know about common birds, there's always something that pops in that makes you rethink it. Now this is out of basically your your common uh, coffee table book. What we have visiting down here this time of year and I'll explain what I mean by visiting because it's a little different. One of the most spectacular birds, of course, is our cedar waxwing. They are a beautiful bird. That coloring on that bird is really, really something, something we should really look at carefully to enjoy all, this, all the different subtle colors on this beautiful cedar waxwing. Um, he's a berry eater. The bill looks like that's not really all that conical. Um, I think you'll see them flying around Chico this time of year, but just for your information, you can tell them even when they're quite a ways away because when they fly, they usually fly in like big flocks, sometimes in 50, 60, even bigger than that. And they'll fly in an oval where the birds inside the oval seem to be changing position. Now there's another bird that fly in flocks too, but it's almost guaranteed that you're seeing the cedar waxwing fly around as they, and they, as I say, they, they kind of mill around inside this oval of flying birds and in great numbers. And you can tell the cedar waxwing from a distance. They also have a bad habit of eating berries. And sometimes the berries are, let's put it, fermented for a better way of putting it. And they do poop all over your car, as you probably know, and it can be really messy. Uh, uh, beautiful bird though. Uh, now our, we have our, of course, our dark, our dark eyed juncos. Um, that can be at your feeder now here. And if you people are in Chico, you people up in the foothills, of course, in the conifers, you'll see them a lot more than we do, but they do come down here, uh, but they tend to nest up higher up in the conifers if they get a chance, our little uh, junco. It's one of my favorite birds. I banded a lot of these and they, they always give you a fight. They're basically a sparrow, um, but it's a really, really a neat bird. Uh, they'll be down here for the winter, but again, we'll seek a little uh, further up slope to, in, order to, uh, in order to breed. Uh, you may have these coming to your junk, uh, to your feeder now, the uh, golden crown sparrows. Uh, can't very well miss this. Um, and we're gonna be talking about plumage in a minute in my next slide, so hang on there. But uh, you'll have these golden crown um, uh, sparrows down here. They won't nest here, they'll get the heck out, head up out of our area here. Um, but they'll be here for the winter time. Of course, we're overloaded right now with the white crown sparrows. Now white, Crown sparrows, most of them do get out, but there is a, a one a subspecies that does hang around along the coastal areas um, that does breed in California. But surprisingly, a lot of these right crown sparrows get the heck out of town and also head north. So we'll have them here for a while at our feeders. And, and uh, right now they're in great numbers. And then we have the uh, yellow rump warbler here, which at one time was separated into two species, the Audubon warbler and the myrtle. Now, if you want to sound like a real seasoned birder, you don't call them yellow rump warblers, you call them butterbutts. And you can see why they get the name butterbutt here. And this one you can't see, but I assure you it has a butterbutt. The main difference you can see here is the throat, which is the most outstanding thing you see right away uh, on this myrtle subspecies compared to the Audubon, which has a yellow throat. Now, these are pictures of birds that you would see in their good plumage, okay? The reality is, is what we have now here around town might be quite a bit different. And it also brings up the fact that name plumage changes have happened over time, and it's back in the last 20 some odd years. What they now call, what you and I, oh, old time we would have called breeding plumage, is now known, and let's start with, uh, let me start here with the uh, yellow rump warbler, is now known as a alternate plumage. Because really, we used to call that the, the breeding plumage, right? But now we know it's not, it's the alternate, we call it now the alternate plumage. People will still say breeding plumage, but technically be, to be correct, you should be called the alternate plumage. Now the birds we have around Chico right now in our area in general, or the foothills even, are in their basic plumage. In other words, after they have bred, they do a molt and they dump all these nice bright feathers and become little more, well, a little more plain. 
and here is a, and this is a, we, I believe a myrtle, a myrtle uh, uh, yellow rump warbler. Usually they have a more stronger uh, eye line than the Audubon uh, subspecies. So I think this is a, and again, it's not that easy one to make a call on, but anyway, I think this is a, a uh, the myrtle uh, yellow rump warbler. Um, this is the basic plumage because they hold this most of the year. So we used to call it non-breeding, but to get it correct, we should call it basic. Now we go up here to our white crown sparrow. White crown sparrows start out looking like this. In fact, they have a, a, a juvenile plumage which I'm not showing you, but after they dump that juvenile plumage, they look like this. And you probably have a lot of these in your backyard right now. These are what we call hatching or second year birds. Now, when I say second year, what it means is that as of January, they became one year old. It's like horses. They're no longer the hatching year. They now become a second year bird once January. Forget about when they were born or when they hatched. All right, uh, they are now second year birds. And that's the ones we have a lot of in our backyard right now. I have more of them than I do have the, uh, the adult birds. And then once they do another molt after this one, they'll end up being, uh, as you see over here, the um, uh, white crown sparrows that you uh, have in your backyard also right now. And they will retain this um, plumage even to the, the uh, alternate part as the called breeding time, okay? The, now down here, I just showed the golden crown because it also does the same thing. It has the alternate and the basic and they're really almost cannot tell the difference between the two. Uh, might be a little duller in the fall, um, but basically once they become pure adults, they have this. Now here is a bird that's a juvenile. And remember we talked about the white crown sparrow up here and notice the nose streaking here because this one's already done its juvenile molt. This bird has not done so. It's a uh, golden crown. You can see a hint of a golden crown coming in here, but notice all this dumpy stuff down here. It will jump, dump this and become like the white crown sparrow here. And the yellow will become a little more uh, pronounced as it goes along, but it will drop all that. And then it will be into its hatching year, second year thing. So I just throw, throw this in because of the name changes on breeding and non-breeding and all the confusion. Uh, even more complicated than that because you can have your first pre-alternate and your first pre-basic and it goes on and on and on, more than we didn't know for this talk. But I thought it'd be good to see uh, some of the, the changes or uh, terminology changes happen over time. Now, no fair booing, no fair hissing, it's not their fault and it's true. Um, one I want to talk about here, first of all, is the European starling and the two pictures of it here and over here on the left side. Notice I say non-breeding. Wait a minute, what about, what about my alternate and basic? Is that basic and this is breeding? Or, or, or is this the uh, alternate? Well, here's the problem. The starling only has the one molt. And this is it, it molts into this. And this will carry this through the fall and into the winter months and just right now. And what is starting to happen now is that all these little white tips you see here on the feathers will begin to wear off. And they already have actually. Not only that, the bill obviously is starting to lose the melon and the yellow pigment starts coming out. So you have a yellow bill. But notice that if you imagine all these little white edging here to these feathers as the white wears off and the white on the feather is not as strong as the dark melanin feathers, you end up with this. And you may see little hints of white here and there scattered around where it hasn't quite worn off. So it doesn't really molt into a quote breeding plumage, it just wears off the white off its uh, basic plumage, I guess you'd have to say. And then it becomes uh, this shiny thing here. As you probably know the story on these guys, they're not uh, native here, uh, they are uh, from Europe. Uh, the story goes that a person who was very fond of Shakespeare's plays decided to bring them over and he wanted to bring the birds from Shakespeare's play and release them in New York City Park, Central Park which he did. And of course, they've now taken over the country. Uh, there's all the way across the country. There's expected around about 200 million starlings now in our country. Uh, the number seems to have, has kind of stopped growing. It seems like it's stuck at about 200 million and uh, it doesn't seem to be increasing anymore. And you know, it's a problem for us because they do take over any cavity nesting birds play, even woodpeckers, they'll chase woodpeckers out of the nesting hole. Bluebirds suffer badly from, from starlings also. Uh, notice the bill, kind of a probing bill, and they do like to probe. So they're a probing bird. 
Um, but again, can't blame the birds, not their fault. We brought them in here and it's our fault, not theirs. In the middle, you have two pictures of brown headed cowbirds, a female and a male on top. Um, technically, they used to be called buffalo birds. They probably should have been called bison birds, which is what our buffaloes in the plains are really should be called, but we'll call them buffalo birds because they used to follow the buffalo herds out in the Great Plains. Uh, they like buffalo patties, I could say cow patties, but buffalo patties because they are filled with undigested seeds and things that have gone through the bison's elementary tract and so it had been dumped out on the ground and so they, they follow the herds. Well, what have we done? We've taken our cattle and we brought them across our country. We brought them up into the foothills of the Sierras, higher up to the high country. I know where I have my uh, cabin in the Sierra, they go up to about 7,000 feet in no meadow, bring their cattle up there to feed. Um, and so guess who came along for the ride? The brown-headed cowbirds. And probably most of you know that the brown-headed cowbird is a parasitic uh, nester. It lays its eggs at other birds' nests. Um, they have found some female cowbirds that have laid as much as 40 eggs, 40 eggs in a breeding season in other birds' nests. Remember that American goldfinch I showed you earlier? It's one of the few birds that can feed its young nothing but seeds. It doesn't have to give it any protein from insects. And so what happens is if the, uh, if the brown-headed cowbird female lays its egg into a American goldfinch nest, it doesn't survive. It'll hatch out, but it doesn't survive because it doesn't get any protein that it can use. It doesn't get any spiders or beetles or any other thing that normally would be fed to a, a, a bird because of the young of the goldfinch doesn't need any protein of that kind. Protein, it gets it from the seed, all it needs. Um, so here we have, uh, I think it's the last I heard, it was something like 19, and 18, oh gee, I gotta remember this now. Um, there were no brownhead cowbirds in San Francisco uh, uh, up to 1870. So it was the moving west of the cattle that brought them into our, our country now. Um, they do parasitize a lot of birds. It's really, really, very sad. But it's not their fault. It's our fault. We brought them here. And here's a good example of what I was talking about, which you have. These are very bad pictures. Most of my pictures are pretty bad. I took these up in Canada. Um, this is a uh, yellow rump warbler here feeding uh, its young cowbird that it's raised. Um, as you probably know, the cowbird uh, hatches. It's much bigger than the other birds. It's, it quote, siblings, which would be other, in this case, uh, yellow rump warbler young, and it will push the, either the eggs out or the nestlings out. And so it'd be the only thing left in the nest is the cowbird. And uh, wonder what goes through the mind of the, of the yellow rump warbler in this case, or in this case down here, a junco that's uh, being chased by a cowbird that is raised, begging to be fed. Um, uh, but maybe it's thinking did a good job. Who knows, huh? Wow, what a kid I raised. Must be a paleo diet. So unfortunately, uh, we brought the cowbirds out here and now we're paying the price for it. Here is our one of two endemics. And one of them is of course the yellow-billed magpie, which we are very proud of down here in the North Valley. Uh, only, that's only a, one of two birds that are found in California. And you might say, wait a minute, I thought the yellow-billed magpie was the only endemic. No, you gotta count our Santa Cruz scrub jay. It's only found on the Santa Cruz Island, which is part of California. So we can't count the uh, yellow bill as being our only endemic. Uh, it's going, probably building a nest now. If you have some of you live out in the valley area, flat area, you may see them building nests in riparian areas, things like that. Uh, they build kind of a dome nest, um, a really neat bird. And one we should be very proud of here in, uh, in California is our one of two endemic birds. Dana Pepla is a flycatcher, but he doesn't do much flycatch. I, I broke down the name. The pheno means shiny, and the pepla comes from either robe or cloak. So it's a shiny, shiny robe bird, and it has a gloss to it, if you see it. You can go up, uh, um, uh, well, Bidwell Park, the Ahi Trail, places like that, and you'll see the, uh, and it's a resident here. Um, not as easy to see in the, in the winter as in the summertime and springtime, but the, the pheno pepla, uh, it's one of the silky flycatchers, but it spends more time eating berries and things. It's not really a big flycatcher as much as it is a berry type of a bird feeding on that sort of thing. And if you go up the 
up the trail, the Ahi Trail, and did well. Uh, you can't help but see this guy, our spotted toe, a resident bird here. Most of you probably know about pishing if you make the sound like pss, 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 uh, around a blackberry bush or something like that, or thick scrub. I guarantee you a spotted toe will pop up and give you a look. It's a beautiful bird, um, very, very common in our area here. There is a, used to be called the rufous sided, or the rufous side, rufous sided toey, uh, but they were split many years ago into an eastern toey, which doesn't have nearly the amount of spotting as you see in our bird here. Uh, and our out here is now called the spotted toey, uh, meat bird. And it sounds like a cat. If you walk along the road and you don't hear it doing this, it has a nice song, but you don't hear the song, you may hear like when you think it's a meow, kind of a, it sounds like a cat in the bushes. And it's our friend, the spotted toy makes that mewing sound, kind of a neat, neat bird that way. Um, all right. Now everybody likes hawks. And one of our hawks that really likes us is the red shoulder hawk. They are really all over the place. They love human beings, especially in Florida and California. They're not so gregarious in other parts of the United States, but they seem to like human beings in Florida and in California. Um, you may hear that key, 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 and I'm not doing a very good job. I don't imitate very well, but a key, 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 key sound of the uh, uh, red shoulder hawk we have around here. Uh, good place to see him is at the, uh, I call it the genetic center off uh, Skyline there. It's a good place, practically anywhere in Chico area, you'll see the red shoulder hawk, a beautiful bird, really is pretty. And then of course we have over here on the far right is the red tail hawk. Um, they are residents here, but their numbers increase as birds come down out of the north to join them down here. We have our population down here that sticks around all, all year long. They are residents, but sometimes, uh, but not sometimes, a lot of them will leave in the winter to go other places to breed. And so the numbers thin out a bit. Now the one in the middle doesn't have a red tail. So it's one of those, what can this possibly be with a looking like that with a tail that's just barred and no color. Well, if we look at it here over in the right hand side, this is a red tailed hawk immature. And one way you can tell an immature red tail, there's three things that help you tell a red tailed hawk. And if you put them all together, you pretty much got it made. One, they tend to have dark heads, not counting the throat here, but the dark head. They tend to have a belly band, which is not showing up all that much in this photograph. But one thing they do have that is really diagnostic is the patagium here, the patagium marks here you see on the wing, this dark area here. If you see that overhead, if the bird flies overhead, you can be rest assured, at least in California here, that you have a red uh, tail hawk, despite the fact it may be missing that nice red tail and just had bars. This is immature. Now, here is the red shoulder hawk we saw perched on the previous slide. Notice also it's kind of like that crescent, white crescents here uh, on the, whoops, on the uh, thing, there we go, on the wing here, here and here. It's even more pronounced a lot of times when you see them on birds. And this is a hint that you have um, a, uh, uh, a red shoulder hawk in flight. And they all have like a checkerboard look to the underside of the wing here. Now, having looked at the red shoulder and looking at the red tail, which are pretty much nice residence birds here, we also have some birds that kind of move through a little bit. And, and you can find them around even the springtime and summertime, but not very, not very commonly. Uh, and that is the sharp shin hawk, for one, and I'll show you another one in a minute. Um, sharp shin hawks and the cooper hawk. Uh, in fact, Jennifer was talking about seeing the cooper hawks uh, earlier today um, before we came online. Um, the sharp shin hawk supposedly, and I say that advisedly, has a square tail. Is that square to you? Or is it slightly rounded? I don't know. Difficult to call. Notice it's heavy streaking underneath here, which tells me right away that's not an adult bird, because here's the adult sharp shin hawk down here. But I call your attention that kind of works, okay? Notice how I, I'm being very careful here. Kind of works. The sharp shin hawk, when it's in flight like this, the wrist of the wing, this part here, my arrow is, I assume you can see the arrow, is almost ahead of the head. Does that make sense? Ahead of the head? Yeah. It's forward of the head a little bit, or at least equal to it. And when we look at the Cooper Hawk, which I'll show you in a second, you won't see that as readily, okay? 
one other thing that somebody always told me about, and I try to use it in, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, is that on a sharp shin hawk, the eye looks like it's a little too big for the head. I'll let you decide if you want to go along with that or not. But the head, the eye seems like it's, well, a little too big. It should be a little bit smaller. But let's make sure we look at that wrist thing here. This next shot is from uh, uh, the Crosley guide. It's really of Eastern bird, but it includes awful lot of uh, our West Coast birds. So it works for us also out here. All these photo, all these images he has taken of, of this case, Cooper Hawk, are uh, all on one page. And you can see them in different flights and different uh, plumages. I think it's a neat, neat idea, the Crosley guide. Uh, last time I served, saw when I went down to uh, Barnes and Noble, they had one copy in there. I don't dare go to them anymore to those places, but nevertheless, when things clear up a little bit, maybe you'll find it. Uh, now, again, one of the things about the Cooper talk, it has a rounded tail. Well, you know, that's great. Look at that, there's a rounded tail. There's a round, there's a rounded tail. It works perfectly. What about that bird? Now, this is a Cooper hawk. What about that bird? What about that bird? These are all Cooper hawks. And now you see why when you go out with some real good birders, if you're a beginning birder, and they say, I think that's a Cooper, uh, this kind of big, uh, maybe it's a sharp shin, uh, except the female, uh, female sharp shin is the same size as the male uh, Cooper hawk. Uh, and you hear this kind of conversation. It tends to work, what I said on the previous slide. If you look at the head, notice the wrist. It is considerably behind the head. Even in this photograph, it's behind the head. In this photograph, it's behind the head. And this one, uh, let's not pretend like we didn't see that one. Okay, so you get that, that might be a little, if you get the bird to fly, might be a big help. Does the, does the eye look big for the head to you? Uh, I don't think so. This one looks kind of big though. Uh, I don't know. So maybe the eye thing is not worth using. Um, but I really do like if the bird is flying for this. And some of you probably have other things you can throw in here maybe at the end to help you identify the Cooper and the Sharpshin uh, conundrum. But it's not always an easy call, that's for sure. Oh, pop quiz. Which of the following birds is most likely to prey on a skunk? You get a five second thing. One, two, three, four. Five. And I think most of you uh, probably got it correct because most of you are veterans. And of course, it is the great horned owl that will feed on skunks. Uh, there was a nice one out on the uh, on uh, Highway 32 the other day uh, near Foster or Florist, uh, Forest Avenue. Whew, boy, it stunk bad. Um, so we take this into our owls in. And uh, this photograph I took over in, in Point Race. This is actually one of my pictures of halfway decent. Then of course we have our barn owls. And if you're going down I-5 or some of the major arteries here in, in our area in the valley, um, you may see a bundle of kind of tawny, tawny feathers along the side of the road and kind of fluff. And it might be a, a dead barn owl because they do fly low and they're, they're a candidate to get hit by cars. It's unfortunately, but uh, that's the way it is. Uh, my favorite, barn owl stories. I did a, a, a survey for barn owls literally looking in barns in Sierra Valley. I don't know how many people know where it is. It's on the east slope of the Sierras uh, near Loyalton and, and uh, Sierraville. And we went to barn to barn trying to count the number of barn owls that we could see. And we walked to this one barn and there on the ground dead was a barn owl. And being birders, the four of us decided, tried to decide what killed it. Well, um, great horned owls have been known to kill barn owls. Um, maybe the farmer didn't like it and shot it. Maybe, and we had about four or five maybes, this, that. And then one of our groups said, maybe it just died. And we all stopped and looked at each other and said, what? He says, maybe it just died. We go, oh, can I do that? We had all these convoluted stories of what happened to it. Maybe it had a heart attack. Do birds have heart attacks? Maybe they do. Anyway, it was dead. So barn owl. The other owls that are around here, and really one of our experts around here um, is Dawn Garcia, and she can tell you a lot about the northern Stalwood owl um, that are, are very common in our area. And you know, there is a project to net them here and band them. It's kind of neat. And then, uh, I'm sorry, I'm pointing the wrong one here. And then, of course, our northern pygmy owl 
are some of the owls we see here. This picture I took of the great horn owl, it was actually, uh, the, the owl was perched six feet off the ground, literally at my eye level. And it was in a, a, a group of the small copes of, uh, of, uh, of Monterey Pines. So I walked up to it and I had a very bad camera. So I thought, you know what I'll do? I'll get it, I'll make it full frame. So it could look like it was asleep. So I walked a little closer and a little closer and a little closer. And finally I got it so it filled the whole frame of my camera. And I said, you know, I got one close, maybe I got a close up of the head. And just then it did this. It opened both eyes. And then I slowly backed up and I backed up and I backed up. A friend of a friend of mine was doing uh, a northern pygmy owl study in the hills behind uh, behind uh, the Santa, uh, Santa Cruz, up in the mountains there. And he's playing northern pygmy owl tapes, trying to see if he can get responses and do a count. And bam, he got hit by a great horn owl that flew down and opened up eight stitches in the scalp. He had to have it closed, sutured up, because the great horn owl did not like the idea of a, <laughs> him playing this tape and mistaken him, I guess, for the owl. I don't know, but it opened up his scalp. So they are a big, tough owl. Uh, I thought I'd give you a few great horn owl facts since we're on the topic. Uh, in addition to the skunks, it likes small dogs and cats. Now I caution you, the amount of small dogs and cats that have been taken has been very, very small in spite of all the stories. But would they be able to take one? Yes, they would. I would definitely think they would be able, if they take a skunk, they can certainly take a small cat or even a very small dog. Uh, but most more likely, of course, they're gonna be small mammals, snakes, lizards, and that sort of thing. They are weigh about three and a half pounds. So they're a pretty good sized bird, huh? The wingspan is five feet. Hold your arms out, about from my wrist to my wrist, if I wanted to show you that. Five feet, so that's quite a, quite a span. The talons have a spread of eight inches. And in my particular, hand, that was from my thumb to my middle finger. If I spread my thumb and middle fingers out, that's about eight inches. That's pretty wide. And they can exert a pressure of 300 PSIs, which is more than you and I can do with our hands. So that's a pretty strong grip. And of course, everybody knows that they don't spin their head around in spite of cartoons as in 360, but they can turn 270 degrees, it's quite a ways. And of course they have to because they, they their eyes are fixed and they can't look sideways with their eyes like you and I can. Uh, and I'll tell you this, they're not particularly afraid of you. They are a pretty, pretty self-assured bird, I guess you'd have, have to say about them. By the way, I meant to tell you on the, on the barn owl and, and all owls, especially the barn owl, their ear openings are not symmetrical. They're not level. One side is higher than the other. So that means sound reaches their ears at a different rate on either side of their head. And that means in a com almost completely dark room, barn owls have been known to get zero right in on a released mouse uh, because uh, it can tell where it is just by hearing because of the ears being not on the same level, off-centered a little bit higher, one higher than, than the other. Neat. Hummingbirds. Here's our resident, Annas. He's very happy here. He spends all winter here. They made it, have made it all the way up into um, British lower British Columbia, the lower part of British, just across the Washington border. All there are permanent residents there. Amazing, this little bird, it can survive the cold of these areas. And he defends, as you well know, the male defends his little feeder to the death, so to speak. And he has a bad time because in about another month or two, these guys are going to start coming through California on the way to nest, mainly out of California, somewhere along the Oregon border. There's some areas where they might sneak into California, but basically don't nest in California for the most part. And that is the Rufus hummingbird. And they're pretty aggressive. And it drives our poor Annas crazy because they defend their feeders and these guys don't show them any respect at all. The other bird that we have migrated in here is the black chin hummingbird. It doesn't like the flat of the valley too much. It prefers the more of the foothills. So you people that are up in the foothill paradise, you know, Megalia in that area up there in the foothills might have a better chance of seeing the black uh, chin hummingbird. Although I've had some in my backyard over the years, uh, but it's not a coming word, the common one that I have here. I throw the Allens in because it can be often mistaken for the Rufus because you can see them on a Rufus on it. 
And you say, well, I can tell because it has green on the back and the rufous doesn't. Ah, doesn't always work. Some of the young rufous can have green on the back and are, can be very easily mistaken for the um, Allen's hummingbird. Rule of thumb is you're, you're out of the fog bank that hangs around our coastal areas, you're not gonna see Allen's. Have there been Allen's inland? Yes, there's records for Lassen County, for example. Uh, but it was at a banding station because it's very hard to tell these birds in the wild. If they have a nice sort of green back like that, you might have a chance of seeing them. Uh, their display is different too. They do a J when they do their dive, so that helps you. But uh, really, if you're gonna come and tell somebody here in Chico, I had an Allen's in my backyard, they're gonna give you the squinty eye and ask you, uh, one of the questions they may ask you is actually, uh, is the uh, uh, second retis registry uh, uh, emarginated? That's your second tail feather. Is the second tail feather emarginated or not emarginated? Well, you can imagine trying to see that on a moving hummingbird. Not easy call. Better be tell, be easier to tell if you have one in your hand. Um, now, having said that, in California, you're, you're likely to see about seven species of hummingbirds in California. A lot less around here in Chico, okay? Uh, we did have a cost of hummingbird here uh, was the last year, a couple of years ago, uh, wintering, which is kind of unusual. Um, or I was in the winter, I'm not sure, but it was here. Um, but basically, uh, you're going to see seven species here in all of California. Um, if you're down around Arizona and Texas, you get the bird, the hummingbird that fly across over the, the border, and you can count them in your North America list of birds if you're into listing birds. Uh, and uh, I had seen over 100 hummingbirds. And I was really excited. I thought I saw probably most of them. And here's your pop quiz. The total number of hummingbirds species in the Western Hemisphere is five seconds. One, two, three, four, five. And when I'm doing this at the Snow Goose Festival, I usually pick on somebody who looks very nervous. And I say, well, how about you answering that question? And they can see them tense up. So I say, wait a minute, let me give you a hint. And my hint is pick four. And they go four. And I go, you're right, 363 species all in the Western Hemisphere, as you probably know. I once read a novel way back in my youth and was, I was big into Rome, ancient Rome. And they were talking about the opulence of a food uh, a festival, a food festival they had. And the Nero, it wasn't Nero, but it was some emperor had all these fantastic foods from all over the world, from Africa and everything else. And one of the gourmet things he had was hummingbird tongues. And I thought, wow, that's pretty good since the Europeans and the Eastern Hemisphere had not discovered the North, the Western Hemisphere where all the hummingbirds are. How they got hummingbird, hummingbird tongues there in that festival or the, at the banquet, I don't know, because they weren't there. A little fast, real quick. Smallest is the bee hummingbird, less than a penny. I don't, 1.1 gram, 1.14 gram doesn't mean a lot to you perhaps, but if I say less than a penny, that gives you an idea. Cuba and places like that. The largest is 20 grams. It's kind of misleading to say that it's nine and a half inches long because when they measure it, they count the bill, which is quite long. So it adds maybe a little more to it, but it does have quite a big wingspan of 8.5 inches. Found in South America, Ecuador, Colombia, places like that. It can beat its wings 70 times a second. When I used to talk about birds in my class, uh, I would ask them all to try to wave their arms 20, <laughs> at 70 times a second. It used to call it, it used to wake them up with nothing else in my class so they wouldn't fall asleep. But try it sometimes, you can't do it of course, so many times a second. They can in a, in a dive as much as 200 times a second. It's just hard to fathom muscle being able to twitch that fast in order to do that. Heartbeat, 250, uh, 250 beats per, per minute. So you imagine going to your doctor and he puts a, a stethoscope on you and says, hey, yeah, 250, you're perfectly normal. Mm, not likely, huh? Okay, even in a dive, it may even get more than that. Hard to believe. Um, can fly at 25 to 50 miles per hour. Up in the foothills, worried people are worried about taking their hummingbird feeders down or a little higher up in the Sierra. But a bird, a hummingbird can leave a feeder and in days be 30 miles down, down the canyon, you know? So not really a big problem. They leave when they want to leave. Um, we talked about annas already. Um, heartbeat drops to 50 beats per minute when they go through torpor overnight on a cold night. And think about some of those uh, uh, ruby-throated hummingbirds from back east. They have to fly 18 hours nonstop over the Gulf into their uh, 
uh, over the Gulf of Mexico in order to uh, winter. And by the way, another thing, when people always ask me about a certain, certain bird and they say, where does that bird winter? I always like to say, it doesn't. And they go, what do you mean it doesn't? I say, we winter, it goes back to summer. It's going down to uh, Costa Rica, you know, maybe South America somewhere. It's going back to summer. We winter. Some of our common woodpeckers we have here, the nut owls is uh, uh, almost a California endemic, but it does make it into Baja. So we can't really count it for that. Uh, nice stripe back to it, our nut owls woodpecker, a very common bird around here. Um, and we have a downy woodpecker. And the word downy is named after these feathers on its back. Notice these are barred across here, while here they're kind of a, a, a streak down the back. It, the people that first looked at these thought these were very soft and downy-like. And that's where it's got its name. The, the woodpecker was not named after a, a somebody's name. There's another bird, the woodpecker, that you people up slope might have a better chance of seeing, and it's called the hairy woodpecker. It's bigger, but a lot of times you can mistake them. Uh, sometimes you're, if you go out birding, and it's happened to me many times, my sides get all goofed up. But one way you can tell a downy from a hairy is the downy has a, a shorter bill. If you imagine turning that bill around so it comes this way, this direction, it barely gets past the eye. If you do that visually with a hairy, it will almost go to the back of the head. The bill is much, much longer than the head, uh, than the downy. And the second thing here on the outside retrices, the downy woodpecker has black dots on the white outside tail feather, uh, which the, uh, the, um, the hairy does not have. So that's one way of telling them apart. They do make holes like this. Now, they used to be the thought was the only way back in the 1800s that they were the only bird that did that and they were causing all the trouble, but actually uh, they do not go that deep. They are mainly after grubs, not the sap or cambium of the tree. And so they're not quite as deep as the next, no, one bird in between. Next bird I'll talk about after this one. Um, so going, going back, I go back, yeah, going back, um, they do make holes in a line like that, but there is another uh, bird that does that, the sap sucker, which I'll talk about shortly. Here's a bird that we have out here all along, nice resident bird of ours, and that is the red shaft that's uh, uh, flicker, or now we call the northern flicker. They were once considered two separate species, red shafted for having red shafted. Well, to me, it always seemed orange, but we'll have to go with it. And the uh, yellow shafted, uh, I think Jennifer mentioned she saw one of these today or in the last couple of days. Uh, one of the odd things they, you know, is that they overlap in certain parts of the uh, uh, United States and in, in, near the Rocky areas um, and they interbreed. And so since they interbreed, they don't fit this, the uh, species category. So they had to lump them together. And now we simply call them the Northern Flicker. Uh, it's really a beautiful bird. And, and it's a bird that we kind of take for granted. You know, we go, oh yeah, you know, it's, it, it's just a, one of my favorite lines. It's just a Northern Flicker. Well, it's more than just a Northern Flicker. It's a beautiful bird. Notice, however, the head pattern is completely different. Even if you didn't see the, the yellow shafts, as we say here, you can certainly see that the head pattern is completely different on the two birds. Not to mention on the male, we have the black mustachio, uh, and on the uh, nor our red shafted subspecies out here, we have the uh, red uh, male stripe here. So there you go, or mustache, you want to call it that. Neat bird. And they really like to feed on the ground. They really like ants. So it's one of those birds you'll see on the ground in your grass quite a bit as much as you will in a tree, in fact, almost more so. Uh, they love ants. Two other birds, uh, uh, three other birds I want to talk to you about, uh, two really. One is the red-breasted sapsucker, which is this one here with uh, the Palomarin banding for many years. And this is the uh, subspecies Dugetti, which we have down in California. And this is the Ruber, which is up in the Oregon area, much, much more red on it. They do make big holes in trees. And they can make a line just like you saw on that um, um, downy woodpecker I have. Uh, they, but they tend to make bigger and deeper holes because they want the sap. And they do eat sap. Their tongue is a little bit different than uh, uh, regular woodpeckers would tend to have a barbed tongue uh, to get the grubs when they shoot their tongue into to get the grubs out of the tree. Uh, they do eat the cambium and, and the uh, 
uh, the sap of the tree. Um, my favorite red breast of sapsucker story was not this bird, but I was banding up in the Sierras and we had a young one just really out of the nest cavity. And one of our uh, aides took it out of the net for us and brought it over to me. And it's all kind of a brown and, and it was, you wouldn't recognize that being a red breast of sapsucker. And she said, look, this one's just out of the nest, it stinks. Oh? And it's just, this thing smells bad. Here, Max, smell it. Stupidly, I bent over to smell it. And with that, the sap sucker went Brrr, And I had all these holes on my cheek where it drilled me. So don't fall for the old sap sucker trick of having somebody say, smell my sap sucker. Because it'll drill you. I had all these little holes in the, on my cheek. Lucky didn't get my eye. And of course, one of our can't miss a bird here in Chico is the acorn woodpecker. Um, you're all famous with the granary trees that they build where they have a dead tree usually and they just stuff it full of, of acorns. Uh, they have uh, been counted as many as 10,000 acorns in one tree. This is kind of a job you give to your graduate student, I guess, if you're a professor, say go count the number of acorns in there. Um, it's, a, uh, it's also found uh, in, in Arizona and places like that. So it's not located just in California. But um, if you go up Bidwell Park, of course, you're all familiar with our acorn woodpecker. It is the one that uh, Mel Blanc, we used to do voices for Disney uh, and or some of the, it wasn't Disney, I guess it was another one. Um, um, I can't remember the name of the company now. But anyway, the, the Woody Woodpecker song that you hear that is he patterned it after our good old acorn woodpecker. Can't miss it, pretty striking bird. Um, they family, they form family groups where siblings will actually help the mother and parent, mother, the parent birds <laughs> in the next generation, they actually help feed the young. So they're very social animals or birds. Almost getting through here, but uh, there's several other things here that we have and our, our, some of our residents, the R standing for residents are not rare, but for residents. And of course our morning doves, um, this is a, a picture of one nesting in a tree and uh, a fir tree. And you can see there are two nestlings in here that are almost like pine cones. Uh, uh, on the, the morning dove. The argument is whether the morning doves are, are dropping in number because we have the Eurasian college doves. And just, this is not even scientific, but just seemed to me, I don't see as many morning doves around my house as I used to see. And I see plenty of these, um, of the uh, Eurasian college dove. For a while, it was thought that these guys were not gonna make, make a living here out in the wild, but uh, I think that's not, not the case at all. They seem to be doing, doing quite well. Um, they were thought to have come from the Bahamas. Um, supposedly, I think I'm trying to find a date here, something like um, 1970s or sometime in that, in the supposedly New Province, Bahama, um, a hurricane released the bird out of a pet habitat or something like that. That's a, kind of a convoluted story, but anyway, where they've made it to the mainland. Of course, they've been spreading throughout the United States. I'll tell you a story about this is going to ruin you for any time from now on you hear a calling uh, collared, a Eurasian collared dove, if you have, don't know the story. Supposedly back in the days of Greece, ancient Greece, a woman had a mean mistress, a slave, had a mean mistress, and she didn't pay her very much. So, the servant decided to complain to Zeus and went to the temple and said to the Zeus, said to Zeus, Zeus, please help me out. My mistress is so mean. She only gives me 18 salary, 18 a year. And that's all I get. And I want you to make the world know how cheap she is. And Zeus felt took pity on her and said, I will. And that's what he made the collared dove. And so now if you go for a walk and you hear the collar dove making a call, you will hear 18, 18 pieces, 18 pieces, 18 pieces. And that's what Zeus did. He gave the collar dove, but he just, that mistress was to her servant. 18 pieces, 18 pieces. You'll hear it for now. Every time you hear it, you're gonna be stuck. Here is a bird you can't miss in our Bidwell Park areas or uh, in the, especially over in the, uh, uh, well, anywhere, but especially over in the uh, genetic center. And that is what used to be called the plain tip mouse. 
which has been split now into the oak tip mouths, which we have here. And over on the other side of the Rockies, uh, over the side of the Sierras, I mean, uh, we have the juniper uh, uh, tip mouse now. They have been split. Uh, Dave Hufer refers to the, and the, uh, kind of a, like he stole this from somebody, but I'm going to use it anyway. He says that the, um, uh, I got my, here it is. Um, he calls the uh, call of the tip mouse the voice and soul of the oaks. And you cannot mistake this. Sometimes two notes, very clear, two notes, sometimes three. I would play it, but we tried playing things before and it took the sound off our audio off our, uh, off our uh, website here. So I decided not to do it. So anyway, the plain tip mouse, you can't miss them all year long. Uh, any place you go and there are oaks in, in trees and in, in around here, you're gonna find our oak tip mouse. This time of year, we also have a bird that comes down your, and it, it might pop into your feeder for a few seconds, look around, see if it might pick up a seed, but not very often, doesn't find it very interesting and flies off. And that is our, our ruby crown kinglet. Um, this is how it normally looks, unless it gets very agitated. And you can see this bird is very agitated. This may even be a female, which wouldn't have a red crown anyway, I don't believe, uh, but this is an agitated bird. I only put this bird in, which is the Hutton Vireo, because look how similar these two are. Yes, it does have a thicker bill, which might help you in identifying it, but there's a better way than even that. And that is that the, uh, are all plumages, the ruby crown kinglet has this, nice, has this black bar behind the wing bar. See that black bar? And you notice here, that this lacking in here in the Hutton Vireo. Now the Hutton Vireo isn't here yet. He will migrate in, he's a migrant. So he, hasn't be, he will be here for a little while and not stay probably, he'll be going up slope, but basically he'll show up for a while. Also notice that in most cases, you'll see both wing bars here on your Hutton Vireo, while in the, although it is showing here, it is usually covered up a little bit in the, uh, in the kinglet. The kinglet is a nervous wreck. The ruby crown kinglet's a nervous wreck. It never stops moving and twitching and acting, it, it just constantly moving. While our friend here, the, uh, Hutton Vireo tends to be a little more sedate in movement, not quite as, as frantic as our, our kinglet is here. Finishing up here with uh, two more birds and I have a short ending here are the uh, uh, hermit thrush and the Swainton thrush. We have this hermit thrush here right now. You walk outside and you got thick shrubs and things around, you're almost guaranteed to see a hermit thrush. Uh, Beautiful song, I would play it for you, but again, it seemed to take our audio off and I don't want to mess it up as it is. So I won't play it for you, but pretty obvious thing here that it has a kind of a rusty tail compared to the back. The back usually contrasts with that. It has these little chevrons on the upper breast, but there's also a fox sparrow, which I'm not showing you, which also has chevrons on the breast that you might mistake for it. Uh, Bill's not the same, however. Um, this definitely has a, th oh, let me go back. Has a, oh boy, I went too far, sorry has a, a, a bill like this, so it's not exactly a seed eater. Um, so this is the hermit thrush. Very shortly, in another month or two, we'll see these guys show up, and these are the Swainton thrush. Look very similar. Notice the, the coloration of the back and the tail are pretty much uniform. A little bit of more buff here in the throat, but that's kind of hard to tell because some of these get a little buff in the throat. Um, they do have a buffy eye ring and buffy in through here. Well, these tend not to have that and the eye ring tends to be white. Both of these birds will usually go up slope. So you people up in paradise, Megalia, farther up, will have a chance to have them nesting up in the area. Uh, down here in the Chico area, or Neely area around here, you won't have them nesting. However, if you were to live over in the coastal California, or the coastal mountains of California, both of them breed over there. So uh, uh, that would be exception to the rule, but these birds come through. We're almost done, folks. Now, nah, springtime, not too far away, huh, folks? A couple of months. And I used to have a friend of mine that would phone me. He lived down near San Jose. And I would get a phone call early spring, late March, early spring. And he would just, I would get a phone call. I'd say, hello. And I would hear, swallow, walla, 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 walla. And he would hang up. Because he would, <laughs> that was who he let me know that he saw his first cliff swallow coming through the, coming up from, uh, from down south in uh, the wintering, quote, wintering grounds. Now, one exception to the rule, 
And that is our friend here, the tree swallow. The tree swallow can be found here uh, out in around, I still call it the sewage ponds of, of Chico. Um, and they do tend to be around uh, in the wintertime, not in great numbers, but they are here. The rest of these guys all head out of here because it's hard to get flies. It's hard to get things to feed on. And so the cliff swallow heads out, the barn swallow heads out, uh, as you see the northern rough swing and the violet green. Uh, violet green and this can be mistaken for each other a little bit. This photo is really highlighting the violet green here uh, on the back, but quite often it looks dark. It looks more like that if you don't have the sunlight in the right way. However, notice in the tree swallow, the eye is always in the black or the dark blue of the iridescence, while in the violet green, the eye is rounded by a white. Also, if you can see it, because you can't see it on this bird, but the white here wraps up and almost touches on the uh, uh, violet green where it doesn't do so on the, on the uh, tree swallow. It kind of, there, there is white like this, but it starts right about there. It doesn't come all the way as high. These do make a mess, the cliff swallow, unfortunately. They do build mud, build mud nests and they can be a messy thing, uh, unfortunately. Uh, they may nest under your alcove here in Chico. I've seen them do that, as I have seen the barn swallow. Barn swallow is easier to tell with a nice forked tail. If you go up with uh, what is called the um, Chico Canyon Road, which is the road on the opposite side of the Big Chico Creek uh, uh, golf course, where they, they have a, a retaining wall built of cobbles, kind of a big wall. Uh, they nest in cavities there, the uh, northern rough wing swallow. You can get really good looks at them there. They almost fly right at you. So these are all birds that can show up in the springtime, letting us know that spring is coming. So here we go. Here's the last couple of slides. When spring arrives, this is a test now, we will be seeing a myriad numbers of birds coming here to nest while some will spend only a few days here before moving on. Question, in the following spring bird collage, which bird is not likely to be nesting or migrating through Chico? You ready? One, two, three. Ah, if you pick the ostrich, you are correct. These other birds all do show up and either nest in around our area or they move through. One exception here would be the orange crown warbler, which is can be found here. I have one been around in my house all winter long. Every winter, I seem to have one of these um, orange crown warblers. One of the ro running jokes about how to identify orange crown warbler, it's all yellowish green warbler with no yellow, with no orange crown, because you rarely, unless it's agitated, see that little hint of orange. I picked this slide especially because you can see the orange, but that's about all you see. It's not very, very prevalent. We also hear in the Alta Cal, many of you will say, hey, I just saw there was a uh, Western uh, Kingbird down there in uh, uh, Yuba City. So they're on their way. And as you know, they nest out our, they are found around our grassland area, very common bird. I'll rush through these. Yellow warblers come through, tend to move up slope a little bit, but you can find nesting here. This is the male because he has a nice maroon streaks. The female does not have the maroon streaks. The astro to flycatcher, Western tanager, they'll stick around. Western tanager tends to move a little more up slope. Black headed uh, gross beak will come to your feeders for a while in early spring and then finally tend to go up, up slope a little bit. Wilson warbler, Lasley bunting. Um, of course, out the yellow-headed blackbirds out in the, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, um, middle of our valley, in the, the uh, tulies and places like that, uh, come back in more numbers. I think you may see a few around even in the wintertime, but that's kind of usual. Uh, bullard um, black uh, oriole. And if you have, a, if you have a, uh, a Washington palm somewhere near you, you're probably always guaranteed to get this hooded oriole, which shows up uh, and loves palm trees and loves the nest in palm trees. I have one nearby, two houses away from me, and I get these coming to, uh, I break off the, my hummingbird feeders, some of the little flowers on one of my hummingbird feeders, and, uh, and they come down and sap, uh, they'll get the sap or the uh, hummingbird fluid out. And of course, the lasley bunting, which also tends to go up slope a little bit, beautiful singer, will sing all day, gorgeous bird. Um, uh, these are all birds that we expect to come when spring arrives. And my final thing, as you may or might know, I turned this in and nobody will accept it. I shocked the world with the first photograph of a living velociraptor. And here it is. Now, I submitted this and they said it has feathers. 
I said, dinosaurs now are known to have feathers, which is true, as probably most of you know. They wrote me back and said, it doesn't have arms. I said, the feathers are hiding the arms. They said, it doesn't have teeth. And they got me. I couldn't go any further. They had me. And I had to admit that this was a Southern cassowary young, immature bird that I saw in Australia. And as you can see, you can see almost like, it is almost like a, a velociraptor with a few things missing that it should have. And it actually is a young hearse, of course, of the Southern cassowary. But it's a really, I always look at that. And I had a, I was in a, a downstairs apartment. I had to walk by these birds to get up to the, the main area of the house I was staying at. And I was a little bit nervous because they have a very enlarged inside toe that uh, could really disembowel you if they really wanted to. There's been only one record of a person being killed by a cassowary, by the way, in spite of all the stories you hear. Uh, now, the last thing here, why to get into bird watching? And I usually show this to my group of people uh, at the Snow Goose Festival. First of all, bird watching is a great hobby, similar to hunting, except nobody, nothing gets killed, including you, from a, from a hunter that mistakes you for a buck. Uh, a joy way, a joyful way of keeping track of the changing seasons. Great exercise for eye muscles. I not the best, so just cataract surgery, which I have, and it's a bloody miracle, folks. I guarantee it. You, I'm 2020, cannot believe it, had cataract surgery. Or just bird by ear, which I can't, uh, unless I have my hearing aids on, and even then, not too good. And you can bird anywhere you travel, post COVID-19, that is, or simply enjoy keeping a list in your backyard birds, which many of us did this weekend. Mary and Mary has our list, and Jennifer and a few others. And warning, I have to give a warning birding can become addictive. And that's it. Uh, I hope you submit your questions and maybe we can, and we can get around to answering them. Um, let me right. go back in line here. Uh, yeah. Jennifer. Thank you, Mac. Excellent, excellent uh, program tonight. Um, everybody can unmute if they want, if they're kind of quiet, but uh, in the chat, there's a tremendous amount of great comments, a uh, few questions, but right now, if you want to go ahead and Get those questions in so Matt can bring up chat and see um, your Now, questions. how do I do that, Mary? Help me. Oh, here and top up. Here uh, and top. The little chat button on the bottom next to share screen. Well, I got to take out. I got to get out of uh, um, mute. No, uh, you shouldn't have to be able to. You shouldn't have to get out of that to see it. Just okay. shake your mouse. Shake the mouse and it'll come up. Oh, I just acted. That's okay. Let's throw can, it you, that way. can you see the chat thing now? It's down on the bottom next to share screen. Let me see something here. Let me let me end the show. Oh, okay. There we go. Now I got a bottom screen here. Uh, <laughs> I got a thing on the top. Uh, pause. Maybe you can. Could you see the questions? Yeah, I'll try and find the questions for yeah, you. Yeah, like, why don't you uh, moderate it for us then? You uh, probably know more answers than I will on it anyway. <laughs> we did answer some throughout the thing. Um, mostly they were just comments like people have been seeing evening grow speaks. Um, let's see. I know someone wanted to know if the Eastern and Western metal lark uh, uh, crossbred they, you know what? I don't know if they DNA studies are doing. Mary, do you know of any uh, DNA studies been done on that where they've got hybrids? I have not. I have not heard of it. The song is certainly different, but that doesn't always mean anything, you know. But maybe somebody else can help us out on that. I really don't know. Do you know, Mary? Um, I have not heard that either. I haven't and heard either. It's, it's kind of surprising because they're so close. Yeah, you get down there in Arizona, in the east part of Arizona, outside of the Chir Chiricahuas and places like that, they're supposed to be both. So um, I guess maybe the song keeps them separate when I mean, the nesting season comes. I don't know. Good question. Remember, I got the wisdom now. I can say I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I had a question about the starlings. I wasn't quite sure if... Uh... I've always heard that they wear wear off. Does that mean that the tips they're actually rubbing the tips? Yeah, that's what I said. On they, their feathers. I, 
Yeah, I don't know if they do it themselves and pluck at it or it's just wear. The way I was told, uh, John, is it basically just they just wear, you know, they they have the one mold yeah. only. And, it, mm -hmm. and and during the course of the of the year of doing what they do, the white tips are not as strong as melon filled feathers. You probably know more about it than I do. And the white tips tend to wear because they don't they're not as strong with the, mm -hmm. the melon and they wear mm -hmm. off. And it's just a matter of well, wearing off. You know, yeah. I'm sure the melon goes away, too, if you think of the bill turning yellow. Mm -hmm. So I'm assuming the black bill is because it has melon pigment in it. And that must yeah. just must lose that too. So mm -hmm. that's the most I know about it. And do yeah. you know more any more about it? You can help out or no, no, I don't. I've always yeah. wondered about yeah. it's that. It's just the one but, malt, uh, the one malt they have. Yeah. So that's why I hate to say it's a, a an alternate or a basic malt because there isn't any alternate malt. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's just basic malt. Right. All right. Thanks. Yeah. Great presentation. Oh, thank you. Most of the other, com mostly it was all just comments and um, you can look through it if you want um, or I can give it to you afterwards. Yeah, I, I, I it's funny, I don't, uh, well, maybe this is blocking it. No. Mary? Yeah? If, if people are interested, I'd love to share my picture and see what people think it is. I'd be interested. Yeah, me too. Yeah, it sounds interesting. Let me try. Okay. Um, John can just hit uh, stop screen share. Okay, let me go. <laughs> it's either the top of the, you know, yeah, I don't you know. You are in screen share. Stop screen share. Okay, just clicked on it. Oh, there you go. <laughs> I got the chat. Uh, Everything falling in place. I'm barely in the 21st century, you people. That's Mary's <laughs> carrying me here, so. Well, somebody did say that the Western Meadowlark in case of hybrid, a case of hybridization of the two species in New York is fully substantiated. Oh, well, there you go. Must another be all hybrid, DNA then. I, don't, I, bet hardly, bet. I bet there's hardly any different when it comes to uh, um, uh, plumage then, huh? But look at that one I showed you, which supposedly had the very white supercilia line, and yet it had the yellow going into the mallard stripe. I, you know, so you tell me. I don't know. Uh, I would think that they would hybridize. I don't know. They're just yeah, their range overlaps, and yeah. <laughs> I would think too. Okay, Asia, have you figured out how to share your screen yet? No, oh, it looks like totally different. Oh, by the way, there, there was a great tailed grackle bird in the Winco pet parking lot. Wow. Me, person sent me a picture of it. That's a great spot for one. <laughs> they are they are around. That's yeah. for sure. I wonder if our state flower is invasive there as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I see the great tail grackle uh, a lot of times over at the Larkin Cove for mineral after bay. They're yeah, the after bay. There. I've seen them there. Yeah. 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 I never saw them in Winco. So they're expanding the range <laughs> into, into malls. <laughs> Let's see. Um, lots of great comments. Mac, you're going to have to take some time reading all these wonderful uh, oh, comments. Thank you. I hope I didn't talk too much. I was warning because I get going and I, <laughs> I think I'm talking to myself a lot of times. I hope I... And stumble too much. That's how I am, but I like I like people to just kind of be able to talk during the presentation, just so I know they're there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. That's I true. Oh, we got a picture. Oh wow, wow. yeah, that looks kind of like more like a Cooper's to me. It does um, mean too. Do you I would go for Cooper's also. I thought it was a Cooper's, but I, you know, when y'all brought it up, I was less sure. And some of the things you talked about are not apparent here. No, if you look oh. at the eye, does that eye look like a big for the head? Or does it look about the right size? Look how far forward the eye is on the head, too. Yeah, yeah, that's Skip. How are you, Skip? <laughs> Good. And the tail, you know, it, we're forcing it here, but it looks kind of round. It's kind of worn, of course, because this bird's an adult bird, but uh, you could say it's possibly round, you know. Uh, it's good. You have to admit, though, it, it it is a difficult call a lot of times if you don't get a really super good look at it. Uh, but in flight, that head beyond the wrist of the wing is, is really pretty good in most cases, rather than looking at the tail, the curve of the tail. 
Yeah. You see how the, the orange kind of goes almost all the way back to the nape? Oh, yeah, back in here. That's yeah. another good sign that it's a Cooper's Hawk. The sharp shin oh, will have kind of a little bit darker nape around the back there, the back of the head. Yeah. And looks, to me, I put the in the looks chat. like it's wearing a cap. Yeah. And I put in the chat that, you know, Cooper's Hawks often look mean and the Sharpies look cute. <laughs> <laughs> this is the big that's, manga. That's why I, didn't think it, I don't think this one looks mean though. He looks kind of mean. Look, He's kind of got that the, uh, it's, a, it's a kind subspecies. It was the kind human subspecies. Landed almost next to me. It was so sweet. Yeah, beautiful. Uh -huh. They do come in your bird feeders and we'll sneak a bird out of them, you know. Wow. My wife got mad at me one day because they grabbed they grabbed a lesser goldfinch off my feeder and sat on the post on our fence and plucked the feathers. My wife had me close the blind. It was, it was <laughs> disgusting. That like it looks mean. That's more mean. But yeah, but I don't know. I thought it was sweet, but because it came close to me. It's a sweet subspecies. There's a subspecies. <laughs> I, I thought it was Cooper's because it was so close. I thought it was a great bigger picture, yeah. than Very a sharp nice. shin. I'll yeah. say, I'll say uh, Cooper's. Yeah, I, yeah I, think I, I think Cooper's for yeah. sure. But, yeah, and um, I think. Uh, some of the things that Mary and John pointed out, I think is good too. The, the, the orange wrapping around. All right, well, if no more questions or comments. Um, well, somebody did want me to kind of talk about the salmonella oh, disease good. that's going around. And Audubon is really recommending, if you see any birds that are, they're puffy looking and they just kind of are lethargic, and you can almost walk up to them. They don't move. They'll often either just sit at the bird feeder or sit at the water dish and just sit there for a long time, sometimes just by themselves, even when all the other birds fly away. Um, then they probably have salmonella, salmonellosis or however you say it. <laughs> so um, it's a good time to... Audubon recommends taking down your feeders for a couple of weeks. Um, another thing you can do is don't feed in your feeders, kind of scatter the food around your yard a little bit more so that the birds aren't all concentrated in one spot. You know, of course it passes through feces. So if you're, if, if you have a um, platform feeder like I do, which the birds love, you know that that's going to be kind of an area where the feces will get onto the food. Mm. And also, most birds will tend to poop in their bird baths. So clean your bird bath every day. And um, if you clean things with a bleach solution of one part bleach to nine parts water, that's good enough. So clean out your bird feeders. What I do with my socks, well, I took everything down for a couple of weeks, but I put it back up during the great backyard bird count. And I have not seen another sick one um, this, this whole weekend, which is a good sign. But before I took my bird feeders down a couple of weeks ago, I saw quite a few pine siskins that were puffy and um, earlier in the season, before I knew what the symptoms were, I saw an American goldfinch that probably had salmonella and um, a couple of um, house finches. So I think it's kind of with the finches so much. Um, my, I haven't seen any sign of it in the, in the sparrows that I have, the white crown or golden crown sparrows. But if you do see that, you might want to take it down. Um, what I do is I, I'll spread seed around the yard, but like each day I'll put it in a different part of the yard so that they're not concentrating again. And then if you have regular seed feeders and thistle feeders, thistle feeders are going to be hard because the pine siskins are hit really hard and the goldfinches seem to get it also. So. I took my thistle seed feeders down. This weekend when I put it up, I just put a little bit of seed in the bottom after I completely bleached it. You know, and after I bleach it, I usually wash it with soap and water to get the bleach off. 
Hmm. Um, and then after this weekend, after the great yard, backyard bird count, I'm probably going to take down the sock again and, and not put anything on the platform feeder. And definitely I'll keep the water out there. And of course, you know, it tends to fill up with the rain anyway. So just make sure you get your bird baths cleaned also. Good information, Mary. Thanks. Yeah. All right. Is anyone else? I think um, we just had a great full night. It was great to hear the stories involved with our backyard birds. So thanks, Mac. You're welcome. You're welcome. Excellent. Everybody John, talk. yeah. John, oh, I, I have a quick question. Where oh. where did you get those mealworms? <laughs> just go online and type in. Uh, well, off of uh, Amazon, where you get yeah, go on Amazon. They'll mail or them or eBay or are yeah, they live? And they mail? Come, they come. You can no, get them they're, live. No, you can get them. Uh, well, John, yeah, I'm sorry, you know about oh, it. Um, no, I was, I was. You missed the chat earlier. I was talking about how I feed them to kids during field trips. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, yeah, you can buy. Actually, I've been buying crickets too. Um, so those are those Do are you buy your they, meal Because they actually have dead? eyes. Oh yeah, yeah. They're food. They're they're sold as food in in Mexico and other places around the world. You know, you I can know, get flavored ones. China. You can you can get expensive. You know, fl ones flavored like Cheetos and things like that. But, no. <laughs> uh, I just buy the plain ones because they're cheaper. And yeah, it's just a fun thing. Going to I do that when I'm teaching kids about you know the Native Americans. Uh, you oh, know, cool. eat uh, the insects and it's a good source Here, of protein. Have some. And, yeah. Yeah. Just try it. Okay. Just try one. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. Hopefully we'll be doing field trips again soon and be able yeah. to do that. <laughs> okay. Thank you, everybody. Right. Great show. Yeah, Great thank program. you. Good to see everyone. And we'll see oh, we'll see you next month. Uh, Liam Huber, our hot new young burger. Um, he's got, we'll have quite a program of his one year of them. actively birding our whole area. So we get to see some oh. new areas that he birded in and some rare birds that he's found. So All right. tune, in, tune in next month. All right. Good night, everyone. Hi, everybody. Bye. Thank bye. you. Bye. Thanks again, Mark. Bye now.